Hey guys, today we're talking about guilds. And we're not just talking, we're going to be designing a couple of guilds from scratch, which you guys can use in your campaign settings. I think the best way to teach both new and more experienced dungeon masters how to improve their games is to show you guys what to do rather than just talking about it. This video will include a couple of tables and charts, so make sure you guys don't miss out on them because they will definitely improve your game. Let's jump into the video. I've run a lot of guilds in the past, such as Smith's Guild, Slayer's Guild, Explorer's Guild, Alchemy Guilds. The primary purpose of a guild in medieval society was to foster a stable business environment for members to further their economic success. They also provide a united political voice, which is especially valuable in larger cities where town electives make decisions. When I think of guilds, I look back on my childhood playing RuneScape. I'm talking about original RuneScape, not what they're doing currently. I remember the Cook's Guild was conveniently located to the west of Varrock, and it had its own wheat field. Players who were a part of the guild had access to the amenities that they would provide. This included ranges for cooking, tables for preparing food, a churn for making cream, butter and cheese. There was many ingredients and utensils that you could use for a variety of recipes. And that really made the Cook's Guild a valuable resource, especially for newer players who were just trying to level up. When we play MMORPGs and other video games, it's fair to say that we don't always look at the finer details, but I think now, as Dungeon Masters, creators and players, we look at this stuff a little bit more closely. I think that's what a lot of guilds lack in campaigns that I've seen and heard of. It's, it's depth and value. What makes a guild successful in campaigns, whether your player interacts with it or not? If your players aren't interested in your guild, then it's because you haven't really given them a reason to be interested. For most guilds, this is fine, as most are just there to make the world feel more, more immersive and, and logical. Not every guild needs to be super exciting or interesting, or even open to the party for that matter. But there should be a few guilds in your campaign that you want your players to consider. For me, it really depends on the interests of my party. You know, do any of them have artisans tools or an interest such as archaeology? Developing guilds retrospectively of your players' actions and choices is a good way of almost guaranteeing their interest and getting them engaged. Another idea is to have quest givers be masters of guilds, as this allows your players to interact with these guilds without them being members. You can show off the amenities and potential perks without them even signing up to become a members. The Smith's Guild, the Slayer's Guild, and the Explorer's Guild are great examples of guilds that typically work in most campaigns due to the typical structure of, of an adventuring party. But how about we try and design one of these guilds that I just referenced, and I'll explain to you guys all of the things that I consider. If you guys are new to the channel, make sure you've hit that subscribe button and left your notifications on if you want to see more videos like this on a number of topics encompassing TTRPG game design and world development. I have other videos on my channel including designing towns and how to design a crypt and I'll assure you guys that there is going to be a video on how to make a great tavern that will be up on the channel later this month. Thanks guys, let's make a guild. I've decided for the purpose of this video to make a Smith's Guild. The reason why is because it's the most practical guild and every major settlement is going to have one. Also, most Dwarven player characters take Smith's tools, so it's rather likely you're going to at least have one player who is interested in smithing. In more traditional fantasy, guilds would not typically allow artisans to work within their sphere of influence without them first joining the guild. This allowed craftsmen to be incredibly organised, tactile, and be able to control assets and revenue coming into their settlements. I guess you could consider it a monopoly. A lot of guilds would offer work to new members, train them in various techniques, and invest in their projects if the master felt it was a good idea. That's exactly what we're going to try and do with the Smiths Guild. The first thing we're going to do is give this guild a name. We could call it the Smiths Guild if we would like, but I'm going to give it a cool name. I'm going to call it the King's Smithy Society, or the KSS for short. Let's hope this guild can live up to its great name. <laughs> the first thing we need to consider is the purpose. I think the society is going to be a place for the smiths to meet, drink, and discuss business. They'd likely have an office or two for paperwork, as well as maybe a few guest rooms for visitors to stay in. Actually, I think we'll scratch the guest rooms. Uh, if visitors come, maybe there'll be a couple of apartments that they, we can just offer them. 
Uh, I think they'd also have somewhere to do their trade, so like a workshop, as well as a storage area for any guild goods or trade. I decided to make a floor plan of the society, and it didn't really take me too long to make once I had an idea of what I wanted to do. You don't, you don't need to do this, but, you know, I decided to. <laughs> a simple key and explanation is really all you need for a, for a session. When I prepare a guild, I consider the regulations that the guild can have. I have access to a great resource called the City Builder, a guide to designing communities, which is a PDF that I, you know, I have on file, which outlines some really straightforward rules and tables for making guilds more interesting. I'll put them on the screen for you guys just so you can take a look. If you want the full value of these tables and some other systems that you can use, I'd recommend purchasing the book, but these tables should be enough to get you started and get you to where you need to be. I usually come up with a few ideas, write them down somewhere, and represent them whenever I can. Maybe the party comes into a tavern and hears a master smith complaining about the guild tax this month, about how he's barely breaking even. Or perhaps they go past a dwarf who's living on the street and has a sign saying, Will Smith for food. These guilds can shape and add debt to your campaign setting, but let's not finish yet. Let's, let's keep going. These are the regulations that the KSS is going to have. All journeymen and masters must pay a tithe of 10% of their earnings when smithing to the guild. All smith workshops in the guild's sphere of influence must be licensed by the KSS to operate and must pass their quality inspection bar every two years. Travelling smiths, who are not members of the guild, must purchase an associate license from the guild house when selling metalwork within the town's sphere of influence. This typically costs 5 to 10 gold pieces. Travelling smiths, who are members of the society must represent the guild abroad by taking KSS approved and branded equipment with them. Failure to comply with these regulations means the person would be fined based on the seriousness of the offence. For incredibly egregious offences, membership can be revoked and in some places could lead to arrest. If players come into town and start trying to sell their armour and weapons, it will quickly lead back to the KSS, who will likely send out a journeyman to inquire whether this party have their papers to sell things in the town or not. It's fair to say that guilds, whilst they might be a little bit strict and have rules and regulations, can also offer many things to those who join. These are the amenities of the guild and need to be considered for any guild that you want your players to in interact with. Giving your players genuine incentives to join a guild is really going to motivate them to invest time and effort into it. I run a low fantasy campaign where players are spending copper pieces buying food and drink, as well as cots for rest in taverns. If a Slayer's Guild allows membership for one gold piece a month, which includes a month of stay in their on-site housing, as well as food and drink in the dinner hall, it's a sound deal for the party and it's none of the headache that they would normally have trying to find places in town to stay. And especially if we consider that the Slayer's Guild is likely going to offer things like special monster bounties and cheaper armor repairs. I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? I've written up the benefits of being an apprentice, a journeyman, and a master in the KSS. Just so there's some kind of depth and advancement for the players who join. Uh, and this is with the assumption that there's at least one or two players in the party who are interested in smithing. I'm not going to do this if nobody's interested. Let's talk about what they're going to offer. For an apprentice, the player would gain access to practical training and development underneath a local smith whenever they have free time. The player would gain access to the dining hall and bar of the society headquarters for which they would pay a standard price for drinks. They'd also be able to purchase materials for use in smithing from the guild at 10% cheaper than a typical rate. They can rent out use in the workshop at a base rate of 5 silver pennies a day. You can see, based on what I've stated above, that I'm trying to come up with ways to exploit the amenities that the Smiths Guild has, as well as any social political sway that they might have in town. A lot of people join guilds because of the opportunity that they give an advancement. It's important to remember that, especially with a lot of high-end guilds. The rank of journeyman would gain access to the advanced training that the guild offers towards becoming a master smith in their specialization. The guild offers membership to smiths of all specializations, ranging from weapons to armor to things like horseshoes. In my campaigns, players only gain proficiency in one type of smithing, meaning and if an armorer wants to make a weapon, they'll be rolling without their proficiency bonus. 
Being able to do advanced training allows players to begin their long journey towards gaining expertise with their chosen tool, or proficiency with a different tool or a different type of smithing, as well as working towards the status of a master smith within the guild's sphere of influence. The guild can also find work for the player for up to four days a week with a smith who's requiring help. This may not always be of your specialization, however. The player gains full membership to the guild house, which includes free drink within reason. They are also able to purchase materials uh, for smithing from the guild at 20% cheaper than the typical rate, which is considerably better than what you would get as an apprentice. Anything the guild does not have in storage, they can place an order for, uh, with an estimated delivery time of 14 days. Getting stuff at 20% cheaper than the base rate in Dungeons & Dragons means that you can, you can actually make equipment uh, and armor, weapons, everything a lot cheaper. And you can actually probably make profit if you tried to sell that off if you actually made something good. Something definitely to consider. It's a good idea. The guild's already sounding quite spicy for somebody who wants to, like, you know, get really good at making armor. Uh, they can also rent out the workshop for free as long as they don't have any outstanding debts with the guild. Players who are the rank of master gain documentation that references their position within the KSS, which gives them access to various premium inns and taverns across the region. They have premium access to the guildhouse and free drinks whilst there. They are able to purchase materials for use in smithing from the guild at 25% cheaper than typical rates. They have free use of the workshop whenever they need it. The guild will also send apprentices and journeymen to work underneath you whenever you need help with a project and the guild will actually pay for these people so you don't have to. That's a KSS wrapped up with a bow. Be aware that my example is clearly a more advanced guild, something I'd want my players to really sink their teeth into if I had a couple of people interested in various specialisations of smithing. If you want to do something simple, how about we do a local fishing guild? They don't have a guild house, but instead operate out of a tavern called the Dancing Pike, owned by a retired fisherman by the name of Old Pete. Joining the guild is optional and not necessary to fish in town. Membership costs one gold a month. Membership gets you cheaper bait, wire, and nets from the tavern. You get a free pint a day at the pub. You are guaranteed employment five days a week on a randomly assigned boat if you do not already have employment and you're looking for work. You gain free admission into seasonal trophy fishing contests, which includes a prize pool. And you also get a metal pin of a dancing pike, which you can wear on your clothes, allowing you to proudly represent the guild. That's much simpler than the Smiths, as we're straight to the point. Both of these styles work well for campaigns, and I feel like we're all able to do this. It's about being in the right mindset to understand what your players want. Sometimes we get so in our own heads as dungeon masters and creators that we forget what it's like to be a player. I haven't been a player in years, so I definitely, you know, I can definitely think that's the case for me. It's been quite a long video today, but I hope you guys have gained value from it. If you decide to follow my advice and design your own guilds, feel free to post your examples in our public discord, which I've linked in the description. I'll see you guys next time on Loki's Lair. Until then.